Though it is unclear how and when the practice of controlling the masses began, there is no doubt that even in the today and now, we are a controlled society by a wealthy elite. You and I are simply the cogs and pulleys that keep everything ticking over. There are translations from ancient texts that suggest that we are a civilization created for the purposes of carrying out work on the earth for the benefit of a completely different race of beings who came here to the earth for gold and other resources. The Anunnaki are no longer present here on the earth in any visible presence, but their methods of social control remains and we human beings are hardwired to follow these processes. This is why we work, rest and play. The Anunnaki gave us structure in return for these fundamental values. They are worshiped as gods. But the case of a few benefiting from the many has spread into human culture. When these gods left after the great flood, faith in their return remained, and this left the door open for that void to be filled from Mesopotamia into Egypt and Greece and eventually leading to the rise of the Roman Empire and the Catholic Church. People needed a purpose and efforts were put in place by the survivors of the flood to reestablish this order. And this led to kingship, royalty, and eventually governments. These were the practices of old, repurposed when the Anunnaki left. Now at this point, you guys are probably wondering where we're going with this, right? The point we are making is that a more advanced society of that than our own has existed above us on this planet before. And this practice is remembered as something good. And when Columbus sailed for the Americas, he knew this fine well. Wait till you hear this. When the King of Spain funded Columbus's expedition to India in 1492, he had no idea that what lay ahead would be considered the greatest surprise in human history. The discovery of America by European adventurers who had no idea it was there, you see. There was an old myth that you could fall off the edge of the world at this time, so nobody really dared go that far. We only knew about three continents just over 500 years ago. Asia, Europe, and Africa. But when he was stranded in Jamaica during his fourth such voyage, he used his intelligence to impress the local residents. He used his foreknowledge of a lunar eclipse to fool the natives of Jamaica into provisioning his men. Knowledge is power when dealing with a less advanced society, and these people had no qualms about using advanced predictions of celestial events like eclipses to con the natives. After the American colonies had broken away, Britain still fought a long regarded action, trying to undermine the fledgling United States in whatever way possible. Knowledge of an impending total solar eclipse due to cross North America in 1806 provides an example. As the settlers gradually moved West, the indigenous people were resentful with good reason. British agents in Canada seem to have convinced against the Yankees by telling the Shawnee tribe of Ohio and Indiana when the eclipse would occur, and their leaders used this to stir an uprising, saying that a sign was due from the Great Spirit in the sky. It all ended in tears at the Battle of Tippecanoe in 1811, but the eclipse provided the focus. According to The Guardian, Mark Twain seems to have known of this episode and used it as a basis for a segment of his 1889 novel, A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court. Reversing the Shawnee episode, Twain has Hank Morgan, the Yankee in the title, hoodwinking the ignorant folk in King Arthur's England by invoking prior knowledge of a solar eclipse due in June of 528. Even stating the precise time of totality, he used his imagination, though there was no eclipse around that epoch. 
Christopher Columbus, on the other hand, on his fourth transatlantic voyage, had been stranded with his men on the north coast of Jamaica, their last two ships riddled with marine worms. Having sent a small party to Spanish-occupied Hispaniola, a hundred miles to the east, paddling canoes hewn from local timber, Columbus awaited rescue, but their food had run out, and the Jamaicans, who had been pleased to provision them when they first arrived, had tired of the trinkets the Spaniards could offer in exchange. Luckily, Columbus had astronomical tables with him, which indicated a lunar eclipse was due on February 29th. Calling the local chiefs together, Columbus gravely told them that the god of the Christians was all-powerful and very displeased with the Jamaicans' refusal to keep them fed. And as a sign of his wrath, the moon would be darkened and turn the color of blood that evening. Many of the natives laughed, although others were not so sure. However, all were convinced when the eclipse began as Columbus had told them it would. To add to the effect, Columbus retired to his cabin to consult with God and ask him to withdraw his sign, or so the admiral told them. In fact, he was timing the eclipse with his sand glass, re-emerging at the appropriate juncture. The outcome was, as Columbus had anticipated, convinced of the power of this God, the Jamaicans fell to their knees begging forgiveness. The stranded Europeans did not want for anything again before their rescue six months later. This is the same as with the cargo cults of the 20th century when the mighty naval vessels of World War II gathered in the small islands with indigenous tribes. They seen these mighty things as the vessels of the gods, and when cargo was dropped by plane onto the island, they seen this as gifts from the gods. We will leave it at that for the moment, guys, and we do hope that you enjoyed this video. Sign the comments section below and let us know your thoughts on the matter. And as always, thank you for watching.